Welcome to Art Matters. I'm here today with Lynn Myers, whose exhibition, Blue Study, will be running from March 1st to May 4th, 2014, here at the museum. So, let me ask a few questions of Lynn, and uh, beginning with, how did you decide to become an artist? Oh, I think I was always an artist. It wasn't really a decision. Just, you know, I've always drawn and made art, and I think it probably was my destiny. And uh, did you get uh, training? Did you go to art school? How did, I did. You, how did, how did you? How do we get to this? So I went to a special program when I was in high school that was a half day art program. So I went to high school for half a day, and then I went to a different public high school mm -hmm. where I just studied art. And that led me to going to art school mm -hmm. for four years to get a BFA. Okay. And then um, a year later, I went to, um, I moved to California for my master's degree in fine art. Right. Yeah. So you're fully credentialed. <laughs> I guess you can say that, or overtrained. <laughs> well, I like that. And um, so really, already in high school, you knew this is what you wanted to do. That's, uh, that's fairly rare, but maybe not, not unique. Well, I didn't call myself an artist. I think mm -hmm. I probably didn't feel I had license to do that for many years. But um, it was always what I loved to do. So mm -hmm. and it was always what I spent all of my spare time doing. And you spent a lot of time drawing. Yes, yes. yes. I've you, always drawn. And you yeah. still draw a I lot. I do, yeah. Although for years I was a painter. Mm -hmm. And I feel like now I'm sort of um, mixing it up between painting and drawing. Mm -hmm. But I've always drawn, I taught myself to draw when I was a child by copying Leonardo da Vinci drawings. So. That's, a, that's a pretty high standard. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a good master. <laughs> right. that, that's, uh, well, and I, I noticed, and they'll, they'll, um, uh, we'll make sure that uh, we have a couple shots of some of the works that are on um, notebook paper. So yeah. that sort of, to me, reminded me of um, art that you do see people, where a lot of people start out with that, that, mm -hmm. type, of, that type of drawing. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of accidental that mm -hmm. I started working on that paper. It was found paper, right. and I just liked the quality of it. Um, and it's a little bit transparent the way the mylar is, but mm -hmm. you know, it has more to do with, I guess, the fiber that the paper is made out of, because mm -hmm. it, it's not synthetic like the mm -hmm. mylar. But um, I don't know exactly, when I started doing that, it was a number of years ago, mm -hmm. and I, I guess I, I love the um, the graph paper that sort of sets a more um, mathematical scene behind right. the organic right. line work that I draw. There's a grid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, uh, if we look at a at a work like this, mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that I think to myself is, wow, that. Is quite, that took a long time to create. Yeah, a lot of people say that. A lot of people say that, I bet. So not, nothing yeah. original there. But um, it's still, it's impressive because you think about the concentration, uh, the rigor uh, that goes in. Could you talk a little bit about your artistic process today? And, mm -hmm. and, and how do you, uh, what are the materials that you use? And, and how do you uh, arrive at a piece like this? That's a big chunk of <laughs> yes. information to bite into. Right. Well, I usually begin with preparatory studies. Mm -hmm. So the works that you referenced on graph paper right. would um, would sort of be the preparation for the larger works. Mm -hmm. And um, I do it that way because the, um, the compositions kind of drive themselves. And um, the graph paper drawings are an opportunity to see what's going to happen when I start out, you know, with one kind of structure mm -hmm. to see... Um, what what the organic outcome is right. of that structure. So that's where I start, and with a work like this, I probably did five to ten preparatory drawings, and mm -hmm. each one of those is very time-consuming. Yeah. But by the time I reach this point, um, it kind of flows. Right. So this piece involved laying down a field of color with the broad brush strokes before mm -hmm. I started drawing. So it really is a combination of painting and drawing. Mm -hmm. And um, and then so once that's that's blue. The, the blue that exactly. is essentially the, the background. Of exactly. The mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, and then once that was laid out, um, I started with a structure of large circles that I placed into the composition, and then the the line work grows out of those mm -hmm. that more geometric um, structure. So even though it has the appearance of kind of a free-flowing, organic um, 
drawing, right. it actually is based on something much more mathematical. Right, and there's a there's a model, and you take a model, and, and you're in, at least uh, that's the starting point. Exactly, that's, that's the starting point. So it's very hard to anticipate <laughs> what will happen while I'm making the drawing, right. and they never actually correspond exactly to the preparatory right. drawings. But the smaller works are sort of a way of just getting a sense of where I'm going to begin, right. and then. I don't, I don't cling to that outcome. Right. So even though I think I might know where the drawing is going to go, right. um, you know, once I start on a larger scale, I have to sort of um, give in to the fact that the drawing is going to have its own life and right. kind of drive itself in a certain direction that I don't have that much control over. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have to ask a question here that we have not talked about before. When I look at a work like this, I can imagine you working, and I think. Um, does she go into some kind of a trance? I mean, is there, is there, because uh, it's, it is, uh, it's challenging to be able to have that kind of control over the line uh, and, and even with that model in your, in your head, I mean, can you talk about that? I mean, when you're working, are you in some kind of zone or you said the flow? Yeah. Uh, where does, uh, what's the experience like? There's definitely a kind of concentration that takes over that doesn't necessarily exist in many different parts of our lives. Right. But I think that um, you know writers probably experience mm -hmm. that when they're really involved in a, in a writing composition. Right. And I know athletes talk right. about having that experience. Right. So um, I don't I don't think it's you know specific to this process, but it definitely is a place that one gets to where. Um, the most of the outside world kind of begins to disappear a little bit, mm -hmm. and and the I guess you know some people talk about some people use the word meditation when they talk about my work, and I I think the way in which it's meditative is the way in which thoughts come and go, and um, mm -hmm. you know in in many different places of our lives we might get into thinking about one thing and then kind of perseverate on that mm -hmm. and. With my process, I think that um, you know there's there's a lot more flow to the way that my mind is working. Mm -hmm. I also try not to get too deep into kind of more concrete thinking. Uh -huh. You know, so it's um, I don't I don't want that to seem like it's a thoughtless process, right. but it's a more internal process, I guess. Mm -hmm. And my sense is that the the lines are kind of. Um, a reflection of my internal energy, and so there's you have a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah, I do have a lot of energy, and so it's more of a um, kind of a direct translation of my physical self and mm -hmm. my internal self onto the um, onto the mylar, rather than a more intellectualized approach. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would I would note for the people who are, who are watching this that we also have some videos of you working in larger projects mm -hmm. and I, I think um, that must be especially hard because uh, when you're in the studio all right you can close things out you can right. control it but when you're in a, in a museum mm -hmm. like uh, I believe at the Phelps collection mm -hmm. and uh, a couple other places you've been uh, you're out there and uh, there are people walking around and how do you get to that level of concentration it is different right. I think um, I can tune out a lot of what's going on around mm -hmm. me, um, except for when people are talking directly right. <laughs> to me, which I try and dissuade. Right. But um, there's so much preparation that goes into those projects, you know, months of preparation, right. that um, by the time I'm there and working, you know, my focus really narrows down into the process. Right. Um, the thing that is probably more challenging than tuning out the environment is um, the fact that with those projects, I'm on um, a tight schedule. Right. So as you know, museums <laughs> only have so much time between exhibitions. Right. And so if I'm given two weeks to do a project, then at the end of those tweaks, I have to have a finished work of right. art. And in the studio, there's always an opportunity to turn around and say, this one wasn't working. I'm going to toss it and start over again. But you can't do, do you? that <laughs> when you're doing a site-specific project. And because they are kind of organic and a little bit unpredictable, there's a sense of walking a tightrope, right. which I think is a little bit addictive and right. very appealing on the, in, in 
one way and in another way there's um, something so special about having my private space right. in the studio and working um, you know in a solo manner right. well it's quite a performance in any case it, it is, is. It is. Yes. And, and then a lot of people don't necessarily aren't able to experience that yeah. The the performative right. aspect of right. it, yeah. You know, I'm I have some slightly conflicted feelings about that because I don't want it to become um, kind of a trick. Right. Like, how'd she do this? <laughs> you know, how did this appear in two right. weeks? Right. And I think um, there's that possibility that it become sort of stunt art, right. and mm -hmm. I don't want that to happen. Right. But I, I think when I when I when that first occurred to me with some of the first large works that I did. I realized that it's it's the the explanation is it's not a it's not a stunt it's a demonstration of dedication. Oh, and a lot of hard work. It's yeah. a demonstration of a lot of a lot of hard work. Yeah. What I found fascinating when I first looked at, at, at those uh, videos was you do get that sense of the diligence of the hard work or the mm -hmm. rigor that go, goes into this. It doesn't just pow appear there. Right. And I I think that's. Uh, in some ways very very useful or revealing certainly to people who might not be familiar with it uh, or with um, non-objective art or the, and, and may not uh, occur to them how much rigor uh, is involved. Or, but let me uh, ask you a couple quick questions. What, what materials do you use mm -hmm. in creating these works? So um, the larger works in the show and the framed works are done on mylar which is a polyester material yeah. that some people call vellum, but, uh -huh. but vellum is in made of sheepskin, right? Right. <laughs> so it, it, but it has some of the same luminosity. Right. Um, and then um, I almost always work with acrylic ink. Mm -hmm. So it's similar to acrylic paint, but it's just um, it flows more like an ink. Mm -hmm. And um, but it has many of the same qualities, and it has um, a real density of color in it so that I can get these deep washes, like the blue in the background, and I can get this very opaque, lighter line on top of it. Mm -hmm. and, and you hold it like a pencil, much of it, right? So there's the, um, the brushwork is done with a thick right. brush, like a Japanese right. brush. And then the line work is done in two ways. I have um, these tools that actually kind of look like magic markers, uh -huh. and they come empty and I can fill them with whatever color, paint, ink mm -hmm. I'd like. And I have a certain sort of um, chemistry <laughs> to doing that. And then um, once I get the primary line work down, I often will use a brush to kind of fine tune it. And so I think there's a picture of me working in the uh -huh. studio on this piece where I'm, I'm actually using a teeny tiny little brush, but the whole piece isn't made with that. Right. Yeah. Great. Well. Thank you very much. We're very pleased to have Lynn Myers here at the Academy Art Museum and I encourage you all to come down and take a look at Blue Study. Thank you. Thank you.